It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, this message is, is entitled Bible Prophecy, God's Order of Events. Now, let's bow our hearts as we ask the Lord to uh, bless his word. Lord, we love you. And again, we thank you uh, as always. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege first and foremost as we come before you. Lord, it's a privilege today as we come before your people. And Lord, we ask today by your Holy Spirit that you would open the scriptures to our hearts. Lord, as we look at Bible prophecy, God's order of events, Lord, allow the word of God to, 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 to make plain uh, the end times. Lord, remove the confusion and the fear regarding the last days. And Lord, we ask today that you breathe afresh on this message. We thank you and we love you now in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this picture because this picture, uh, it's a synoptic view of prophecy. Uh, there's so many things about prophecy that we see there. We see Christ on the cross. We see the battle of Armageddon. We see the nation of Israel. Uh, you see the lamb coming out of the earth uh, with the 666. That represents uh, the false prophet in Revelation chapter uh, 13. You see the beast coming out of the earth. There's so much stuff in prophecy. Uh, again, that people don't like to study Bible prophecy. But again, uh, God has so beautifully given us the end of the story. And again, as we look at the scripture, we can see that God has so, so plainly uh, given us uh, what he's going to do in the end times. Now, a lot of people, because they don't understand Bible prophecy or they're afraid of the end times, uh, they think that the world is aimlessly going by itself. They think with all the chaos and the troubles that are going on, that, that God is not in control and that uh, God can care less with what is happening to the earth. But as I always like to say in this message, God is in control and he has a divine order. Uh, what we're going to see is God's divine order. God has order. There's nothing that's going on today that is not, uh, that has caught Father God off guard. Nothing has caught him off guard. Everything that's happening, uh, believe it or not, is right on schedule based on his prophetic plan. Uh, God knew exactly what's going on. You know, I don't worry about Kim Jong-un. Uh, in North Korea. I don't worry about the Iranians, uh, whether they're going to nuke America. I don't worry about none of that. You know why? Because God is in control. Uh, everything is working to his good. And again, we're going to see that. Now, I want to bring in our prophecy chart. And, and what it is, is a chart of time. It's a dispensational chart. It's a map of the end times. It's going to put Bible prophecy in perspective. I want to bring in this little red line. This first line you see represents everything in prophecy that would take place on planet Earth. You see the red line going at the top there. It represents everything that would take place in the heavens. And then beneath would be things that would transpire or take place in the underworld. Uh, all of this is related to Bible prophecy. All of this is leading us to a finality. In other words, it's leading us to the end of the story. It's leading us to the end uh, 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 end of the world in reference to what God has, has in store for us. Now, I will say this. The end of the world for the redeemed is not a bad thing. Uh, the end of the world for us is a beautiful uh, situation. Uh, we're going to wind up in eternal bliss with God, with our creator. Uh, we're going to see a beautiful uh, eternity. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, many people today are afraid of it. You know, and what I found out that once people understand that God has a plan and when they see the end of the story, it really takes the fear out. And it gives them hope that goes beyond this present world. Now, as always, I'm a topical teacher. So we look at a number of things. We're going to also we're going to define this morning. What is Bible prophecy? Uh, it's not some aimless uh, teaching. It is a biblical study. We're going to see what does the Bible say about God and Bible prophecy? The, the scripture is going to tell us about God and his relationship to prophecy in the end times. And then why should we study Bible prophecy? Why should this message be a part of our Christian diet? Why should we study at least once a year uh, the, the end time studies? At least once a year, uh, we should go through the book of Revelation or go through the book of Daniel. Uh, why should this be a part of our everyday, uh, I mean, part of our Christian diet? And then uh, lastly, I'm going to give you an overview, a general overview of the chart. And we're going to give you a synoptic view of prophecy from the cross of Christ all the way to eternity. And we'll do it in a very timely manner. I always like to start off uh, with uh, verses here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Peter wrote this. He said, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. I love this. Peter said here, we have a sure word of prophecy. 
What God is going to reveal to us, you can stand on it. You can trust it. It's a sure word of prophecy. You can put your life on it. You can put your eternal life on it. It's a sure word. He said we need to take heed to it. Uh, as God revealed the word, we're going to take heed to what God's sure word has given us. In verse 20, he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. I love that part of the verse because here God is telling us that he did not give Bible prophecy just to one man or one prophet. He didn't give Moses all the prophets. He didn't give Zechariah all, all the prophecies. He didn't give uh, 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 Malachi all the prof uh, prophecies. Uh, all through history, biblical history, God God used prophecies, uh, prophecy, prophets of old, and he gave them bits and pieces of his eternal plan for the future. In that, God protected the integrity of Bible prophecy. Uh, verse 21 says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I really love that these prophets of old, these men were moved by the Holy Spirit. And again, a lot of time when the Spirit of God moved upon these prophets, a lot of time they didn't realize that they were really writing prophetic things, uh, but what they were writing were prophetic. And as we uh, can, can see from our advantage, uh, it was amazing how God, through all these different prophets, he, he gave us a whole panoramic picture of the end times. We are living in some exciting times because we are seeing prophets and their prophecies come to pass before our very eyes. There are centuries in between a lot of the prophecies, but today it reads like a current day newspaper. The things that we are seeing that's coming to pass before us, is just so amazing. So Bible prophecy, again, God has uh, so beautifully uh, given it to us uh, in his word. Now, I like this quote here from uh, uh, the late uh, Dr. Chuck Missler's book, Prophecy 2020. He said this, we don't take prophecy seriously because it's in the Bible. We take the Bible seriously because of the track record of his prophecies. Out of all the books or religious books that are out there, if you want to call it that, uh, but the Bible is the only book that has prophecies that you can track that are accurate accurate and are literally coming to pass. Uh, there's no prophecies in the Quran. There's no prophecies in the, in the uh, Hindu vagrants. There's no prophecies uh, in, in the Book of Mormon. You know, I get a question all the time. Brother Perkins, how you know that Bible you have is the right one? But the way we know it is because the track record of prophecy. Uh, Bible prophecy is coming to pass before our very eyes. You know, God brought Israel back into world history. You know, God said, he told Amos that he's going to bring Israel back. Uh, he told Jeremiah he would bring Israel back in the latter days. Today, we have the nation of Israel back on the maps. National Geographic had to change their maps because God brought this little nation back into world history. Prophecy coming to pass before our very eyes. It proves to us that only God could have inspired the Bible. And again, we can, we can trust it. Uh, Dr. Robert uh, Richard Booker, in his book, The End of All Things is at Hand, he said this about prophecy. He said, when we study the, uh, the Bible and world history, we see that God has a plan for mankind and that he is actively moving world events forward to fulfill that plan. He has written these events in the Bible so we can know his plan and see it unfold uh, throughout the pages of world history. It is all there in the Bible if we just take time to study it for ourselves. I love that. Prophecy is there. The end of the story is there. All we need to do is just take time to study the word. Uh, some people think, well, you know, Brother Perkins, only the prophecy guys who God have called to teach Bible prophecy are the only ones that can understand and decipher this. That's not true. Uh, if you're born again, believer today, you can understand the end of the story. You just simply ask God, give me understanding. Lord, open my understanding. And God will so beautifully open the end time message to you. As a matter of fact, he put it in the word of God for all of us as students to study the word. When we study uh, the end time message, Bible prophecy comes alive. Now, what is Bible prophecy? I always like to define it. What is Bible prophecy? It's not some hocus pocus. It's not some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, mediums. Uh, you know, it's not some, uh, you know, fortune telling, you know, Bible prophecy is, is biblical and we're going to see it. So what is Bible prophecy or what is prophecy? Bible prophecy signifies the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God. In other words, if you want to know how God feels about the future, you need to study Bible prophecy. 
God tells you exactly what he feels and what he uh, is going to do, uh, what he thinks about the end times in this message of Bible prophecy. Prophecy is not necessarily nor even primarily foretelling. It is the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means. It is the forth telling of the will of God, whether with reference to the past, the present or the future. And I love that. It's the forth telling of the will of God is God's will in advance. And I love that. The foretelling. God is letting us know what he's going to do before it happens. Not only that, looking at Bible prophecy, we're going to see here uh, Dr. John W. Brad, uh, Bradbury in his book, The Sure Word of Prophecy. Listen to what he says about Bible prophecy and in, in giving us some, some understanding about it. He said, Christian eschatology and prophecy are interwoven in the teachings of the Bible to such an extent that the knowledge of the first is limited to the extent that we comprehend the second. And what he's saying here is this. If you don't understand the end of the story, it's going to affect everything else you believe in the Bible. And I'll also say it this way, too. If you don't understand the Genesis record, it will also affect everything you believe going forward. Uh, we need the two bookends of the Bible. We need the, the correct Genesis record about how God created the planet. And we need the end of the story, how God's going to bring everything uh, to a beautiful close. And we spend eternity with him. But both of these bookends in the Bible will give you clarity and it will help put the, the, the middle uh, the middle of the Bible together and to give you some uh, some clarity. Uh, also, every doctrine of the Christian faith has its conclusion or culmination in that future, which is the burden of biblical prophecy and ignorance of this prophecy or any perversion of it seriously affects one's concept of the pure faith. It is for this reason, therefore, that a clear biblical expression concerning Bible prophecy is necessary. I love this. It is necessary that we understand the end of the story. It's necessary that we study Bible prophecy. It's necessary that you have a, a prophecy guy come in every now and then and stir your hearts regarding the end times. You know, a lot of times we, we never study the end time message. Some people, uh, I have pastors and, and they've told me, Brother Perkins, I'll be honest with you. I have no appetite for the end time message. That's why I bring you in once a year. And it re it's really a blessing. I mean, they say we bring you in to stir the people, to give them understanding of the end time because we realize that this is part of the word of God. Uh, Paul said, I have not shunned to give you the whole counsel of God. So uh, this message, it must be a part of our understanding as Christians. We must have it. Uh, and again, because there's so much de debate about it, people don't want to people don't want to learn it. Now, uh, in the definition of Dr. Bradbury, he used the word eschatology. And I always like to define the, the term eschatology. Uh, what is eschatology? It's a biblical word. It's a biblical uh, understanding. Eschatology is a division of systematic theology dealing with the doctrines of death uh, resurrection, the second coming of Christ, the end of the age, divine judgment, and the future state. It properly includes all that was prophetic of future events when recorded in the scripture. Biblical eschatology assumes that the scripture predicts future events with infallible accuracy and constitutes a divine disclosure of the future. I love that. This study of Bible prophecy from a theological standpoint is called eschatology. It is uh, the end of the story. But it's, it's the end of the story that is systematically given you know, chronologically in Scripture. And again, we can see that. Uh, I love the latter part of it, it says uh, eschatology assumes that the Scripture preach, uh, teaches it with infallible accuracy. And that is so true. As we see these prophecies come to, fast, come to pass, we know that, that the Word of God is solid. And again, we can trust it. Uh, going a little bit further with the, with the definition, eschatology is not designed to satisfy curiosity but to provide an intelligent comprehension of the future as a guide for a present program and a future ground of hope. I love that. Uh, it's a guide, and I love that. It's a guide to help you in your present life regarding the future. See, when you understand the end of the story, it's going to cause you to live right in the current. Uh, it, it will help you live a holy life. I can tell by looking at a person's life whether they understand the future or not by the way they live. If you understand that there's a, 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 an end, if you understand that God has a judgment for rebels, it will cause you to live a different life. If you understand that there is a, a, an eternal world for the redeemed that you'll be a part of, it causes you to live a little different. You know, uh, I'm not so quick to give up uh, uh, my, you know, my walk with Christ because I understand the end of the story. A lot of people, you know, they vacillate. They go back and forth. One minute they're with the Lord, the next minute they're in the world. One minute they're with the Lord. Uh, they, don't, they don't have a proper understanding of the future. 
You know, if you understand where you are, where you are going, that you're going to spend eternity with him, you will let nothing and nobody uh, interfere with it. Uh, you won't let anything get, 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 get in the way of it. And, you know, when I looked at prophecy and I looked at uh, that our end will be a future a physical prophecy. In other words, we're going we're gonna to be with God on, on, the, on, 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 the, on a beautiful world, the new earth, and we'll have houses, the Bible says. Uh, scripture says we'll eat, it, eat it of the tree of life. I mean, it's going to be a, a natural, tangible eternity. It has substance to my future. You know what I mean? Because I'll be honest with you, when I first started studying, uh, you know, I had all these weird ideas about the future, you know. Uh, you may have heard me say this before, that I, I thought uh, when we go to heaven, we're going to have white robes, we'll have wings, you know, I'll have harps playing, you know. This was my concept of the future. And, and uh, you know, when you watch TV, you see the commercials, and, you know, every view you see of heaven is some, uh, some spiritual thing. It's not, not a tangible world. And, and I had to say to myself, you know, if, that's, is, if that is what eternity looks like, that's going to be very boring. Um, our eternity does not look like that. Uh, when we look at what the Word of God teaches about our future, uh, it gives us a, a, a wonderful uh, guide to what God is going to do in our lives in the end. And I tell you one thing, I am so excited about the end uh, that it is just, it's just wonderful. Now, what does the Bible tell us about God and Bible prophecy? God's relationship to prophecy in the end times. Uh, I want to quote a few verses here. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verse number 10, I love this. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I love this. God says, uh, I am God who will declare the end of the story at the beginning. And see, this is Bible prophecy here. Uh, God is the only God that can do that because he knows uh, the past, the present and the future. Isaiah 48, look at this, verses three uh, and five. He said, I have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them and I did them suddenly and they came to pass. God says, I am God who declares the former things at the beginning. I'm going to declare the end before it happens. Verse five says, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee before it came to pass. God says, I showed it to you. And I love that. God showed it to us before he did it. The book of Amos said that God would do nothing in the earth except he first reveal it to his prophets first. So again, everything that's happening now, I'm telling you, what is happening today in our world uh, is right on schedule with God's prophetic uh, program. Uh, and again, we're going to see some amazing things as we go forward. Now, why should we study Bible prophecy? Why should this be a part of our diet? Why should we uh, have these type of teachings in the church? Uh, we're going to look at a, a number of reasons here. And one of the first ones I like to always deal with is we should study Bible prophecy because Bible prophecy is in the word of God. And we are commanded to study the word of God. Uh, Thirty three percent of your Bible is prophetic in nature. Uh, if you're doing a walkthrough in the Bible in a year, 33 percent of what you walk through in that whole year is prophetic in nature. And a lot of times, many people do a walkthrough in the Bible, but what they do, they just read. They don't study. They're just reading through it. Uh, I've gotten through the Bible. I've got it another year. I've done it. But then you stop and say, well, what have you learned as you walk through that Bible? Uh, a lot of times, it's like we're just hitting the time clock. You know, I read, I read three chapters a day, and that's it. But what did you learn? What did you glean out of that? Uh, we got to study. We must study the Word. 33% of the Bible is prophetic in nature. And again, it'll give you understanding regarding the end times. Uh, why should we study Bible prophecy? Because Bible prophecy, it answers hard questions that no other study in the Bible does. And, and I like that. I gave some examples. Uh, this one here is uh, uh, one, one of the questions that Bible prophecy answer is what happens to the dead after death? You know, a lot of people wonder that. Uh, do we go to purgatory? Uh, do we go to uh, just soul sleep? Do we just cease to exist? Uh, what happens to the dead after death? Well, the Bible is quite clear on that. Uh, for Christians, uh, Paul wrote in Corinthians, he said, when a Christian dies, he said, we're absent from the body, but we are present with the Lord. Uh, in reference to the unredeemed, the scripture says in uh, Luke chapter 16, when Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus, uh, the rich man died not because he was rich, but because he didn't repent. But this man died, the Bible says he was buried and in hell, he lifted up his eyes in torment. So we have two people dying, one righteous, one unrighteous, both going to two different places. 
Uh, for the redeemed, we're absent from the body, present with the Lord. For the unredeemed, absent from the body, present in, uh, in uh, Hades and Sheol. So the Bible answers that question. Bible prophecy answers that question. Uh, here's another one. Where will Satan's end be? Again, a lot of people think that Satan is in control, that the devil's running hell. Uh, biblically, Satan has nothing to do with hell other than that hell is a judgment of God created for the devil. Uh, Satan is afraid of hell. And again, Bible prophecy reveals that Satan's end, based on Bible prophecy, is that he will spend eternity in the lake of fire. He will burn forever and ever in the lake of fire. Uh, I think I mentioned before, um, before I became a Christian, I was around 13 years old. I saw this movie and uh, I mentioned it. I saw this movie of Sammy Davis Jr. going to hell. Uh, there was a program. They, they did a movie and a sitcom. It was called uh, The Poor Devil. And Sammy Davis Jr. was considered the poor devil in this in this movie. Uh, they were going to make it a, make it a sitcom series. And what happened, uh, the part I saw when I was 13 years old was Sammy Davis Jr. down in hell throwing the coals on the fire. And this was this is what I saw. And then they showed Satan in hell had offices. I mean, people people, you know, moving to and fro uh, down in hell with with business, you know, offices going on. So in my young impression of mine, I'm thinking that's how hell is, that Satan is in hell running everything, you know. And uh, uh, I, I made the statement. I said, you know, uh, when I go to hell, uh, that's the job I want. I want a job just like Sammy Davis Jr. Throwing the coals on the fire, keeping the sinners burning. This was my concept of hell and Satan in relationship to it. It wasn't until I got saved and born again, got into the word. I started studying Bible prophecy and God began to open the scriptures. And it sh God showed me in his word through his prophetic word that Satan is afraid of this place. He's not running. In, there are no offices down in hell. Uh, there's no bargaining uh, down in hell. You know, it's a reality that God's going to judge the enemy. Bible prophecy answers these questions. Uh, it, 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 it really gives you some clarity in regards to it. And I really believe there's one reason why the enemy don't want you to study the end time message. Here's another one. Uh, a good, good question here is, will the earth be totally destroyed? Uh, in these times, everybody, they are concerned with who's going to destroy the world with all the nukes. Everybody's wondering who's going to push the nuclear, the, the, the red button that's going to destroy planet Earth. Well, uh, to know based on prophecy, mankind cannot destroy planet Earth. He cannot do it uh, for a number of reasons. It's not in prophecy. For one, uh, God has full control over planet Earth. And see, that's this is one reason why I sleep good every night. I don't worry about Kim Jong-un. I don't worry about the Iranians. I don't worry about none of these fellows because I realize we have a God that's in control. And based on scripture, mankind will not destroy planet Earth. He can't do it. I don't care how many nukes may, mankind may have. He cannot destroy planet Earth. Here's another one. Heaven and hell are these real places. You know, Bible prophecy gives us clarity in regards to the reality of heaven and the reality of hell. Uh, these places are real. And the Bible tells us so much about them. You know, uh, I long for the day when we go to heaven. And I long for the day when the Bible talks about heaven becoming a part of the new earth. Uh, God and, and Jesus will reside on the new earth. It's going to be beautiful. And again, uh, I also understand the reality of hell, that it's a real place. Uh, matter of fact, it's so real that Jesus went to Calvary's cross and died on that cross to redeem us from that place. And see, there's one reason why we need to understand God's view of hell. Uh, because it'll give you a burden for the loss in the end times. Okay, here's one last thing. Are we living in the last days? Bible prophecy answers that question, and the answer is yes, sure we are. Uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, uh, Mark uh, 13 talks about the end times with clarity. God tells us specific things that would take place in the last days, and these events are literally coming to pass. You can chronicle where we are based on the prophecies that Bible prophecy give us for the last days. So Bible prophecy answers questions that no other study in the Bible does. Okay, let's go a little further. Another reason for studying Bible prophecy, because Bible prophecy, I love this. It gives hope beyond, uh, I mean, it gives hope to a dying world. It gives hope beyond this present world's problems. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, the present sufferings of this world are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's, that will be revealed in Christ. You got to understand, no matter what we're going through today, I mean, and we all have situations, we all have tough times. I mean, things happen to us. 
Uh, but the key is hanging in there with God because the end of the story for the redeemed is going to be so beautiful. So in looking at this, Bible prophecy gives us hope uh, beyond this present world. And I love this verse here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. Paul wrote, he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Uh, I did a series entitled uh, Hope, uh, of the, the Hope of Every Believer in the Last Days. And I, I went through a litany of things that people are hoping in. And I ask Christians all the time, what are you hoping in? Uh, is your hope in something that could be touched with rust and corruption? Uh, or, or, or is your hope in something that's eternal? Uh, our hope needs to be in those things that are eternal. And you know something? God, God has given us a hope that, that's, a, that's a solid hope for the last days. But Paul said in this verse, he says, Christian, if all of your hope is in this present world, he said, Christian, you are a miserable believer. In other words, if you put all of your hope in this present world that's defiled, that's contaminated with sin, he said, you, you are selling yourself short because what Jesus has purchased for us, our eternity with him is going to be so beautiful. Uh, don't give up today. Don't give up. No matter what you're going through, don't, don't give up on God because the end is going to be so much beautiful and uh, you'll be so happy that you stayed, you know, that you stayed with him. First um, John chapter three, verse three said this. John wrote, and every man that have this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure. I love this. The hope that we have in the latter days is a purifying hope. In other words, it's a hope that will keep you holy. Uh, it'll keep you on a straight and narrow. It'll keep you walking firm with God, committed to him. Uh, if you got a proper hope, uh, again, a lot of people have hope in a lot of different things, uh, but those things are fleeting. Now, give you a few more reasons here regarding why we should study prophecy. Why should we study Bible prophecy? Because Bible prophecy reveals what happens to the wicked or the ungodly in the end. Now, one thing about God, he didn't shy away from showing us the end of the story for the unredeemed. Uh, the scriptures are quite clear. Uh, but to do that, I want to I want to quote here from uh, the book of uh, uh, a quote from Psalm 73. Uh, and I give you the text uh, verses three through twenty three. I won't read all of it. But uh, in an essence, these these passages here talk about uh, looking at the ungodly prosper. Uh, the psalmist here, he was looking at the ungodly prosper. You know, in other words, he said, you know, I got saved. I cleansed my hands in vain. But I'm looking at the world out there. They're doing everything they want to do, and they seem to be living better than we do. You know, a lot of Christians come to, come to the Lord, and they just think everything's going to work out smooth, and, and you're going to get a nice new job, a new house. Jesus is going to take care of everything, and Jesus will take care of everything. But you got to understand, it, it's, not, it's not that type of a gospel. Uh, and what happened when people look at the world prosper and they seem to be going through struggles, a lot of times people question their decision to come to Christ. Well, the psalmist had that same situation and the Bible says he almost backslid. He almost turned his back on God. Uh, however, because of prophecy, the prophecy of judgment on the ungodly, which he learned after he went into the house of God, it caused him not to backslide. In verse uh, 17 of Psalm 73, this is what he said. Well, the verses before he said, I almost turned my back on God. Uh, he said, I cleansed my hands in vain. Verse 17, though, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. He understood the, the end of the wicked, the Bible says. He was looking at the wicked prosper, and he almost turned his back on God until he went to church and heard a prophecy message. And he said, you know something? I found out the end of the story for the wicked. I found out what's going to happen to those who rebel against God, who turn away from God, who, who don't want to serve him. You know, he said, it's best for me to stay with God. And this was his admonishment in the Psalms. I love it so much. You know, I would encourage you to read the whole thing. Psalm 73 verses 3 through 23 It's powerful. Uh, it will firm up your uh, 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 your belief in God and, and what he's done, you know, to give you life. Now, another reason for studying Bible prophecy. Because Bible prophecy reveals what happens to the righteous or the godly in the end. I love this. God has so beautifully showed us the end of the story for the redeemed. One of my favorite passages here, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Peter wrote, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. We're looking for a new world wherein dwells righteousness. This is my hope. This is what I'm longing for. 
As I see prophecies come to pass today, and then I, I have future promises of, e of eternity with God, I'm looking forward to what God told me he's going to do. It gives me strength and encouragement to believe him. Uh, another one, I love this, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. Uh, John wrote, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. I love this. This is our future for the redeemed. A world where there's no more tears, no more sorrow. Can you imagine a world with no more sorrow? A world where there be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more sickness, and no more devil. Uh, not only that, but uh, uh, Revelation 22, 3 says that he will remove the curse. The curse will be lifted. Uh, I like to say it now. He will reverse the curse. Uh, the new world is going to be so beautiful. Uh, we, there won't be thorns and thistles in the new, in the new world. Uh, we're going to see, we're going to see a world where Adam and Eve saw it in the beginning before the curse. He's literally reversing the curse. So Bible prophecy gives us these, these hopes and these answers. And I'm going to give you one more here of why we should study prophecy. And I like this one. Bible prophecy inspires dedicated service to God. You know, I tell people all the time, if you've got a problem allowing God to work in your life, you need to understand Bible prophecy. Uh, Bible prophecy is a motivator to keep you with your hands on the plow. Uh, have you ever felt like giving up? Anybody? My hands up first. I felt like giving up many times. But you know what keeps me going? I know the end of the story. I say it's best to just hang in there one more day. One more day. Things will change. And it does. You know, many people today are giving up. Today, God, want, God wants you to allow him to, to motivate you to do what God has called you to do. So in looking at that, we'll look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7. Uh, this is called the Hall of Faith here. And here it's talking about Noah. Uh, back in the uh, book of Genesis, Noah received a warning from God, a prophecy from God, that God was going to destroy his world. Look what it says in verse 7. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. That's prophecy. God told him, Noah, I'm going to destroy your world. Things that he hadn't seen yet. He was moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. I love this. The Bible says God warned Noah. The Bible says Noah was moved with fear. You know, the fear of God is good. A lot of people think, man, well, you shouldn't fear God. No, you should fear God. You should reverence God. The fear of God is good. You know, the fear of God is worship. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's honor to a holy, sovereign God. You know, this is one reason why the devil uh, have all these horror movies and all, all this stuff. He wants he want you to fear him because Satan understands that fear is a type of worship. Uh, you better fear God. When you fear God, it's a motivator. You know, the Bible said the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. See, Noah received the wisdom of God because he feared God in reference to building that ark. Uh, it motivated Noah 120 years building this ark. And again, every one of us as Christians, you know, we need to allow God's prophecies about the end times uh, to motivate us to do what God has called you to do. Whatever, whatever he's called you to do, whatever it is, let, this, let the end time message motivate you uh, to keep your hands faithful to the plow. I mean, if he called you to be a writer in the end times or a psalmist in the end times or whatever, uh, end time financier or a, a helper in, in, the, in, the, in the kingdom, whatever God has called you to do, allow him to, to work in your life to fulfill what he want to do in your life. And I will say this, everybody here, every one of us here, God want to use us in some capacity. You know, you may be in technology. God may use you in technology, give you wisdom in technology. Uh, that's a gift. But whatever capacity God want to use you in, let him use you in it uh, in these last days because all of those things are helping further the gospel, you know. But allow Bible prophecy to inspire you to be faithful uh, to the call of God. Now, we're going to close up this part of the study and we're going to give a general overview. And what I'm basically going to do is just going to take you through the prophecy chart, going to give you a general overview. It's going to be quick and fast, but I'm just going to give you an overview. Uh, you see the first circle there. We're starting here with the cross of Christ. And I really love this because here, uh, everything that happened to Christ was, was predicted uh, uh, before it happened. Uh, there were over 300 prophecies that led Jesus to Calvary, uh, of which 108 or so were specific in detail. Uh, we did a series on Christ and prophecy. I love this series so much because you see Christ in the Old Testament. But this was one of the beginning things that God did in order 
to bring this world to a close. You know, without Christ coming into the earth, we cannot get to the end of the end of the story. Christ had to come to give us life. Uh, he died on the cross and he fulfilled, you know, all those prophecies from him riding on the donkey into Jerusalem, from him being betrayed with 30 pieces of silver, uh, from, you know, for them piercing him in the side and giving him vinegar to drink. All those prophecies were pre-written in Scripture. And I almost say one, one more thing here. Uh, this is one reason why I knew the, the Da Vinci Code was false teaching, because there was no, no prophecies in the Old Testament talking about the Da Vinci Code. Jesus married Mary Magdalene. When that came out, I said, that's a lie. There was no prophecies ever in Scripture that said Jesus was going to marry Mary Magdalene. Everything Christ did in the New Testament was already pre-written in the Old Testament. And Christ in prophecy, this message here gives us understanding of that. Now we're going to move forward. And you see the next circle there? You have the church age. You have the rapture of the church and then the judgment seat of Christ. Today, currently, we're in what's, we're in what's called the church age or the dispensation of the body of Christ. Uh, it started in the book of Acts. Uh, chapter one. And guess what? Today we're still in the book of Acts, uh, the church age. We're in the book of Acts. Now, regarding the book of Revelation, where are we? We're in Revelation chapter two and chapter three. We are no further in the book of Revelation beyond two and three, uh, two and three. He's dealing with the church age. Uh, we are currently being used by Christ as the body of Christ to reach the world. But there is a prophecy that is coming. Uh, the Bible talks about the rapture of the church. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 through 18, where Christ will literally catch up the church. The Bible said we'll be caught up to meet Christ in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here we will obtain our glorified bodies. The Bible said we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkle of an eye from from mortal to immortality. Uh, Paul wrote in uh, Philippians 320. He said that Jesus, he will change this vile body that it might be fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body. Man, I'm longing for the day when I have that new body. You know, uh, the older I get, more gray comes in and, and the slower I run. I can't run as fast as I used to. It lets me know that I'm, I'm in a world now that's, that's dying and a world that's decaying. Well, once we see that glorified body, it's going to be beautiful. Now, as the church is raptured, we're going to an event in the heavens called the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse 10, and 1 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11. Every born-again believer, every Christian, will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And you will be judged for your labors as a Christian. Uh, you're not judged for, uh, for, for whether you're saved or not. That's already been, ha already been, been, uh, uh, that, that has already been taken care of at, the, at, the, uh, at Calvary. Uh, Jesus, he died in your stead. So you're not, you're not being judged uh, whether you're going to go to heaven or not. You're already in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ at this time. But you will be judged for your works as a Christian. Every Christian's work will be judged in heaven to see what sort it is. Christ will look at the motives of your works and your deeds. Everything you've done, he's going to look at it. And again, Christians' works will be, will be judged here. Uh, the Bible says Christians can obtain rewards at the judgment seat. And I'm going for the rewards. Uh, these are rewards that we can literally lay back at his feet. And again, it's, it's so beautiful. Now, we're going back to the chart, and we're bringing back down to this middle circle here. This is called the time of the Great Tribulation. Uh, this is a future event which, which would take place in the future. Uh, the Bible calls it the time. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, it's a time this world has never seen nor never ever will see again. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, we have the four horse riders of the apocalypse. Uh, there will be 21 judgments that will enter the great tribulation. Seven sealed judgments, seven uh, vile, I mean bold judgments, and I'm sorry, seven sealed judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven vile judgments will enter the tribulation. Not only that, but they'll also have an antichrist, the man of sin. Antichrist will be a part of the tribulation. Uh, it's going to be very hard for people at that time to live for Christ because it may cost their life. But it would be better for them to die a martyr's death in the tribulation than to take the Antichrist's mark of the beast. Antichrist, he will institute uh, his economic system tied to the mark of the beast. And during the tribulation, men will have to either take the mark in order to do transacting, buying and selling, or they will die for their faith in Christ. But it's going to be a different time, a different dispensation, a future event that the Bible has predicted. Jesus talked about it. And again, uh, the things that are setting up right now with technology, the nation of Israel, all these things right now are setting up for the next dispensation of the great uh, tribulation. Now, moving on a little bit further, we're going to look uh, back into the heavens and come back down to the earth. We're going to see the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
the second coming, and then the battle of Armageddon. Uh, I love this, Revelation chapter 19. The Bible talks about here, chapter 19, verse 7 through 10, that there's going to be a banquet spread in heaven. Uh, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, the, the scripture says, blessed are those that are called to this marriage supper, uh, meaning that all the redeemed, those that were raptured at the judgment seat of Christ, all of us will be at the marriage banquet. And uh, I've said many times, you've heard me say it before, that uh, I was so blessed and excited to find out that there will be food in heaven. Yeah. Uh, we're going to actually eat in heaven. People say, well, Brother Perkins, why, 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 why are we going to eat? I mean, do we have to eat? Uh, the scripture says we're going to eat in heaven. That's all I need to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't need to debate about it. I don't need to, you know, the Bible says Jesus will prepare a banquet for us in the heavens. That's good enough for me. I will be at the table. You look for Brother Perkins at the table. Yeah, that's good enough for me. We will eat in our glorified bodies at this wonderful banquet. Uh, then the Bible says that we'll come back with Christ. As our food digests, we will mount up on white horses and we will come back. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. We're going to come back with Christ. We're coming back with him as Christ come back to set up his government in the earth. He's coming back to judge the Antichrist. He's coming back to fulfill Bible prophecy. He's coming back and, and as a result of the second coming, the Bible talks about the battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 19 verses 17 through 21. As a result of the second coming, the Bible gives us this battle of all battles and Christ will uh, reside over this battle. Uh, there will be uh, really, really, uh, the Antichrist and his forces will be gathered, but Jesus, the, the, the Bible has always predicted that Jesus will defeat Antichrist at this time. He's going to judge the Antichrist and his armies at this time. The Bible said the blood will come up to the horse's bridle. Uh, it's going to be in the, the, the valley of Megiddo, which is in the land of Israel. Uh, again, this is the battle. Now, as a result of Christ coming back in the second coming, you see the next circle there. This next circle deals with the millennial reign. Uh, this, again, is fulfillment of prophecy where Jesus Christ is coming back to reside as king, ruler, head of state, Lord, prime minister, potentate, president, presidente, whatever you want to call him. He's going to rule. He's going to lead the world. He's going to be the, the, the ruler of the world. The Bible says that the governments shall be on his shoulders. He's going to rule the world in a theocratic government. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, uh, fulfilling the prophecy, though, of Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. I love that. The nations of the world will literally come and they will honor Christ. They will worship him as Lord and King. Not only that, but we, the righteous who are raptured uh, and come back with Christ, we're going to have Christ govern all over the world. Many of us will be in key places and position of rule to help Christ govern during this millennial kingdom. And it's going to be so beautiful. It's going to be so awesome. Now we're going a step further. We're almost done. Now we're going to look at uh, back, at, back up in heaven. You see the judgment, the great white throne judgment. And then beneath you see the reality of hell. And the Bible talks a lot about both of these events. Uh, a lot of Christians don't like to know about the white throne or the reality of hell. But I, I like to challenge Christians. You need to know about both events. Uh, if there's ever been uh, messages in Bible prophecy that have given me a heart for the loss, it is both of these messages. Uh, at the judgment seat of Christ here, this is where the unredeemed will stand before Christ. Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. The unredeemed man, this person who's not born again, he will stand before Christ, I mean, I mean before God, and God's going to judge every one of them. Everyone that appears here, the Bible lets you know that they will be eternally lost. There's no hope of salvation there. You can't repent at the white throne. You can't say, Lord, forgive me. You can't say, Lord, I accept you now. You can't do it at the white throne. It's too late. This is mankind standing before God without his son. This is men and, and women, stand, men and, men and women standing before God because they did it their own way. Rather than accept Christ, they, they're standing before God with their own works. And what's going to happen, they're going to find out that they have, have fallen short. As a result of that, everybody at the white throne judgment will be cast into the lake of fire. And again, the lake of fire is one of those, you know, this is, this is the eternal hell. Uh, this is the eternal judgment for Satan, sin, uh, fallen mankind, antichrist, false prophet, uh, every devil, every demon, uh, every fallen angel will reside in the lake of fire which is eternal, is an eternal judgment. Uh, it's a real place. It's not a joke. It's not some, uh, some false teaching. Uh, it's a reality. 
And again, mankind will literally stand, stand before that. Now, we're going to close with this last part, and I love this because I never like leaving people, you know, uh, in hell. <laughs> I want to I bring you back to our eternity. Now, we look at the last part of the chart, which is the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to spend eternity upon a new earth, the Bible says, uh, wherein dwells righteousness. Revelation 21, 22 gives us a beautiful picture of, of the eternal world. Uh, the Bible talks about the new Jerusalem that's going to come out of heaven. The Bible said this new Jerusalem will come down from heaven upon the new earth. Uh, it's going to be a brand new earth that's been, that's been totally renovated. God's going to remove all sins, all contaminants, all thorns and thistles, all sin and death will totally be removed. And then the new Jerusalem will come down. You know, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And uh, this place he's preparing for us is the new Jerusalem. He said, in my father's house are many mansions, are many dwelling places. This is where the dwelling places of the redeemed will be in the new Jerusalem. The Bible calls it God's tabernacle, God's dwelling, going to literally come out of heaven upon the new earth. And heaven will be a part of the new earth. God the Father will reside in the city. And we, the redeemed, the Bible says, we'll go in and out of the city at will. The Bible talks about 12 pearly gates around the city. The Bible says the gates will never, ever close. The city will be 1,500 miles square. Can you imagine a city that big? It's going to be unbelievable what this world's going to look like. But what I love so much about it, no more death, sorrow, sickness, devil, or death. We'll live eternity with our God. We'll be able to worship Christ. We'll be able to go and see him. I, I'm, I'm longing for the time where I just go and sit with Jesus and talk with him. I'm longing for that day. I just sit and talk with the Savior. We can talk to Father God and, and won't burn up. You know, we won't, we won't, we won't, uh, we, we can go into his presence because what Christ has done. This has always been the will of God. God wanted ultimate fellowship with mankind. See, if Adam had never sinned, we would be able to fellowship with God like that always. But when Adam sinned, he broke fellowship with God. And therefore, God had to send his son in order to repair that relationship. So Bible prophecy you know, in a nutshell, gives us God's plan to bring mankind uh, from a place of sin to a place of uh, recon reconciliation, a place where he can he can renew his life back with God for all eternity. And this is one reason why I love this message so much. You know, I'm baffled by the by the people that that fight against Bible prophecy. It just it, it baffles my heart how people fight against this message so much. And really, it's a beautiful message for the end times because it, it gives us God's plan for the last days. So we looked at Bible prophecy, God's order of events. And what I want to do, if I can, uh, I want to close with prayer. All right, let's bow our hearts. All right. Father, we love you. And Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the prophetic word. Thank you for Bible prophecy, eschatology, the study of last things. Lord, in these latter days, make every one of us students of your word. Make us students of the scriptures, dear God. And Lord, even those that don't know you, Lord, allow this message to challenge them to receive you today as their Lord and their Savior. Lord, you have so beautifully placed the end of the story in scriptures. And Lord, from what I can see based on Bible prophecy, it's, it will be beautiful for those that surrender their lives to you. Now, Lord, we love you and we thank you. We glorify you and we honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.